biography. <laughs> I should have shortened it. No, that's good. <laughs> Let me again. Oh, you see you last time. Yeah. Okay. So our speaker tonight is Casey Yallowley. She started with the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources as a senior fishery biologist in 2018, located in the Baldwin, Wisconsin office. The area of coverage includes the St. Croix, Pierce, and Western Dunn counties. Some of the largest, largest trout streams she, that she manages include the Rush, Kinnikinnik, Willow, and Ogal River. I'm saying it in mm -hmm. French, so maybe it's not the right way to pronounce it. But. Before coming to Wisconsin, she received her master's degree at the Southern Illinois University. Prior to that, she worked in Northern Idaho as a fishery technician in Cardalen. It's a French word, so I want to say it in French. <laughs> office. She has been working there at the office helping manage the St. Joseph and Cardalen River Tree. She began her career in fishery in Southern Miss Missouri working on large rivers, including the Mississippi, Missouri, Ohio, and Illinois rivers. And so this is a note from Bob. Don't bother asking Casey where she shocked that brook trout in the photo. <laughs> Bob already went there and he spooked all the fishes over. <laughs> so. Okay. Is it loud enough you can hear in the room? Yes. Okay. Let's see. Okay, so Casey will uh, talk very loud. And, okay. So, presentation. Hopefully that'll work. Perfect. Okay. Can everybody online see that? Yep, we can see it. We can hear it. You're ready to go. Sound. Sounds good. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Can you guys hear me in the back? Okay, cool. So um, yeah, I've been here for in my position for about five years now. Um, so I've gotten a feel for things. I wouldn't say that brook trout in that picture, we got a bigger one this last year out of a stream nearby that one. Um, so if anybody um, has questions about that, feel free to answer. I will say it's a, it was in Dunn County also. Um, but that's all I'll give away about that. So, <laughs> um, talk me afterwards. <laughs> um, so today I'm going to talk about um, the Rush River in particular. Um, so we did a ton of sampling on the Rush. We sample it every year, um, but in 2021 we did a much more comprehensive um, sample or survey. So we surveyed it with our stream shocker, pretty much the entire length of it. Um, and in addition to that, we also conducted what's called an angler creel survey. Um, anybody ever heard of a creel survey or been creeled? I'm seeing some head nod and some, some hands raised. Um, yeah, so we basically are interviewing anglers or fishermen um, in an attempt to determine many things about who's fishing and who's utilizing that resource. Um, so I'll just jump right into it here. Um, just a little bit of background on, on the Rush River. You guys are from a pretty popular river. I'm sure most of you have fished it, but um, it's 32 miles of class one and six miles of class two brown trout water. There are brook trout present, but they're in very low densities pretty much throughout the river. Um, this is a high density brown trout fishery. On average, every year, densities for brown trout generally range from 3,000 to 5,000 per mile. Depending on where you go, Oh, in 2021, we got as high as 7,000 per mile in um, one of the stretches that we surveyed. So it's very high density um, fishery. Um, it's large water, it's a fly fishing destination. There's some trophy potential still despite the densities there. Um, this fish we did get during the 2021 survey, it was right around 25 inches. Um, there's been no stocking in the Rush River since 2006 because it hasn't needed it. Um, basically, the river was reliant on stocking. That was back when it was a class two water for its entirety. Um, and things have changed. Groundwater's improved, um, water quality's improved, and the habitat's always been really good. Um, but the cold water with the changes in land use practices made this river basically class one water. Um, so it's totally reliant on natural reproduction and it's 
a major producer. Um, so every year it's naturally sustaining, it gets high fishing pressure. Um, um, and so it's pretty impressive for those reasons. Um, so in 2013, it was upgraded to that class one status, which is basically the best of the best. Um, and the current fishing regulation on the river is a three fish bag limit, um, grounds over 12 and brooks over eight inches only. So you can see from the map here, you have my pointer, the headwaters are located around Baldwin, Wisconsin, which is right about there somewhere. Um, so it's a pretty big watershed. Um, the majority of the class one water is located in Pierce County. Um, it's a tributary of the Mississippi. We do have about six miles of public fishing easements along the river. They're kind of scattered here and there. Um, and it's located pretty close to you guys within 50 miles of the Twin Cities metro area. So this is just a graph here I threw in. Um, this is a result from our sampling in that 20 2021 survey. These are just all the stations that we surveyed. So we did, I think, 13 if you count them. Um, and this is just the densities of trout along the river. So you can see this middle section here is where the highest densities are located. This is a Stonehammer. If anybody's familiar with the Stonehammer area, um, so Stonehammer, um, all the way up to about Highway 63 is where um, the highest densities of brown trout are. So historic fishing pressure, um, it's always been popular. Um, back in the 60s and 70s, um, there were creel surveys conducted back then too. And back then about 20 to 40 anglers per mile were recorded on opening weekends in the 50s. And 60s. So um, it's always been popular. Anglers from across the country and abroad have traveled to fish the Rush River. Um, and after opening weekend and now even, um, pressure drops quite a bit to occasional use um, compared to opening day. That's, that's not as much of the case anymore, but we still do see a drop after opening day. Um, and there were additional coastal surveys, just like the one I'm gonna talk about, um, conducted in 1988 and 89 and 92 and 93. So I'll do a lot of comparing to those surveys from those years. So this is our survey design. Um, if you guys are familiar with the river, we had two sites that were one mile in length each um, that were part of this creel survey. Um, this is the previous one so that we can do fair comparisons. Um, so this is our first site up here is Martel. Um, Highway 63 flows right through there, or runs right through there. Um, so we surveyed anglers within this one mile stretch um, the entire fishing season. And our second site was at El Paso, um, which was also about a one mile section. So um, each site included about three bridge crossings that served as angler. Um, there is um, a fishing easement in the Martel site that I'll show you in the next slide um, that provided additional angler access. And then there's the village park in Martel as well. Um, our creel survey ran from the entire harvest season. So we surveyed anglers from May 1st to October 15th of 2021. Um, we added five additional count sites where we counted vehicles. Um, so basically five days a week, we counted vehicles at all of the little, they're hard to see, purple dots, 730 Stonehammer, uh, 425th, which is uh, O'Gallagher, Usher, Pilling End, Elsie's Rod and Gunner down here at 450, that Fino in the Valley. Um, so we counted vehicles at those sites, um, basically five days a week along with this um, normal, normal creel survey. Um, so we completed um, these counts one weekday and one weekend day per week, only the purple ones. The other ones we did five days per week. So um, that'll all make more sense when I get farther into this. So basically a creel survey, normally you interview anglers in person, someone's coming back from their from their fishing for the day and you stop and you ask them all these questions. Well, since this occurred during COVID and we were restricted from interacting with the public, um, we did it a little bit differently and we used um, postcards that were placed on English windshields that they would fill out later and mail in to us. So that's how we did it this um, year. So we interviewed and counted anglers five days a week. Um, this included all weekend days and holidays. So my technician was out there every weekend 
throughout the summer, throughout the whole fishing season. So um, I have to thank her, Barb Scott. She was out there a lot. Um, and it's not always exciting. <laughs> so um, she, she did a lot. Um, we also interviewed people on um, three weekdays that were randomly chosen throughout the week as well. Um, morning and afternoon shifts were randomly chosen, chosen and count times were randomly chosen. So we're not trying to bias it one way or the other. Oh, we're going to you know, just pre on a holiday because that would obviously bias our sample and make it look like tons more people are fishing the rest of the afternoon. So everything was very random, um, randomly chosen. Um, so basically, we can evaluate several things, but the main things we were after with this survey is um, what we call angler effort. Basically, the measure of angler pressure, fishing pressure on the river. Um, so to get at that, um, we did our angler and vehicle counts two times per day at both this Martell and El Paso stations. So you can see kind of what this covered at Martell. This is Highway 63 ran all the way down, cross the bridge here, cross the bridge here, um, and ended here. So there's an easement here, and these are just all the angler access points. This is the park. Um, El Paso, kind of the same deal. This is County N, um, so bridge here, bridge here. People can access from this little stream, and they can fish this easement. After we interviewed um, <clears throat> anglers five days a week throughout the fishing season. Um, so in addition, to angler effort or pressure, you can also evaluate um, the catch and the harvest. So how many fish are people catching? At what rate are people catching fish? Are they harvesting any and how many? Um, so we can do these harvest and catch rates, catch estimates. Um, like I said, we use mail and postcards. No in-person interviews were conducted like we normally would. Um, did anybody get interviewed? Did anyone fish? Yeah, you did. Okay, cool. Um, awesome. Yeah, well, that's good to hear. Um, this is an example, as you know, of what anglers were given um, when they fished in the rush at the times that Barb was there. So um, this is our normal um, normal survey that we ask people, what time you start, what time you end, what bait did you use, how many fish did you catch, how many fish did you keep, etc. We did ask anglers to measure their fish um, and to record their lengths. And then there was an additional survey questionnaire that um, it was optional for anglers to um, fill out and send back to us. And we did post signs at El Paso and Martel notifying anglers um, that this was going on. And I'll get into all these questions in a bit. So I'm gonna jump in right to the results. Um, I got a lot to share, so I'm just gonna keep it moving. Um, but we distributed a total of 609 surveys 239 of those were returned for a return rate of about 40%, um, which is pretty good. Um, there's a lot of liter literature. There's been tons of trail saver surveys all over the country. And generally, if you get a return rate um, of this high, um, you can have pretty good confidence in the data that you're getting back. So pretty good return rate. Um, so I'm just gonna jump into the demographic side of this. Um, so we asked anglers, um, to indicate if they're male or male anglers and their age. Um, we also indicate or ask anglers to indicate if they're residents or non-residents. We can see how far people are coming to fish the rush. Um, and so basically what we found um, is that the majority of anglers were male. Um, the majority were over 64 years old, um, both in Martell and El Paso. Um, the percentage of English from Minnesota was higher than the percentage of English from Wisconsin. Um, so that was a pretty big change from the last survey where the majority of anglers were resident in uh, Wisconsin. Um, so now it's kind of flopped and now more, more people from Minnesota are fishing the rush. Um, that was even more so the case at El Paso. Um, so like I said, from that 1988 survey, 76% of people fishing the rush in these areas were um, residents and now that's flip-flopped. And then if you look at the red bar, um, you can see um, the age range is pretty similar from the 88 survey as well. Um, so getting into kind of the meat and potatoes of all of this. Oh yeah, yeah. Try to get the meat down. Oh, there we go. Oh, there it goes. That'll be better. Cool, thank you. Um, 
So this is kind of what, this is the data that we were really after. Um, so the total effort um, hours spent on the rush throughout the entire fishing season was 6,500 hours. So what does that mean? Um, how does that compare? Um, I will say right now it was higher at Martell by almost 50%. So a vast majority of people are fishing um, Martell over the rush. So you can see here, um, English spent 4,300 4, hours fishing at the Martell site and about half of that fishing at El Paso. Um, we also measured um, the total number of trips. So the total number basically of anglers um, making a trip or fishing um, was a total of 1,700 trips or 3.9 hours per trip. So anglers generally spent about four hours fishing when they went um, to fish these sites on average. Um, you can see here, it's kind of interesting. People spend a little bit more time fishing the El Paso site than Martel, um, 3.6 versus 4.2 hours. Um, and you can compare this in a bunch of different ways. Um, you can look at it 956 trips per mile of river. So you can take any given mile of the Rush River within this site, and there's going to be about a thousand people that fish it over the course of the fishing season. Um, 5.7 trips per mile per day, um, or 21.6 hours are spent per mile per day. So you can think of that if you're going to go there, um, go and fish the Rush on a given mile in a given day. Um, about 21.6 hours are gonna be spent fishing somewhere at some time during the day. So um, very popular. I'm gonna get into how that compares to other streams across Wisconsin um, in a little bit here. Um, one thing from this graph you can see, so this is um, the amount of effort spent per month. Um, and then I've got Martell and El Paso. So um, a lot of fishing pressure in May, you know, like it, like it historically was in the previous surveys. And then it kind of drops off and evens out after that throughout the rest of the fishing. So May is a very popular month and then it kind of evens out. Mm, it's not, I think I broke it. <laughs> oh, oh, oh no. Let's see, where's my power went? There we go. Okay. Not showing there. There we go. I had this problem earlier today too, so I think it's me. <laughs> there. Thank you. Um, okay, so um Continuing with effort or angler pressure, or fishing pressure, however you want to look at it, um, the percent of the total effort, we said it was most popular in May, if you compare that to the previous survey, it's pretty similar. Um, 1988, there was a, quite a bit more pressure um, in the month of May than these other months, um, where now it's a lot, a lot more even consistently throughout the fishing season. I'll get into reasons why that might be um, in a couple of slides here. Um, so this, what I was talking about here, that angler hours per mile per day, that's basically a measure of um, angler or fisherman, fisherwoman density, basically. So here's the Rush River. Um, and if you remember back, we counted vehicles at all those sites on the Rush, all the way down to Vino in the Valley. So that data we can use to compare. So if you include all of that data, so basically, from Highway 63 down to Highway 10, um, we surveyed that 18.3 miles of river um, for angler effort throughout the year. So that came out to about five um, angler hours per mile per day. If you just look at the Rush River at Martell and El Paso, so two miles, the amount of angler effort or angler density is, is, is insane. Um, and that's mostly because of Martell. Remember we say Martell almost doubled the angler effort was there rather than El Paso. And you can see how this compares to the rest of Wisconsin. So we've got the West Fork of the Kickapoo. Has anybody ever fished that down by La Crosse? Um, very popular river. It's like in the 100 best trout streams in the US trout unlimited book. Um, 
you can see how that compares. This site is more comparable just because this is the ent almost entire river. They surveyed the entire river for this one. So you kind of want to compare apples to apples. But if you just look at this two mile section, the angler density here um, just blows all of these other um, streams out of the water. So this is the White River up in Bayfield County, the Brule. Um, you can see how the Brule compares. Um, and then Wisconsin trout, trout stream, the median is right about here. So even the Rush River, when you look at Highway 63 to Highway 10, um, it's even higher than the trout streams um, mean or average across the state of Wisconsin. So very high angler effort either way you look at it. Um, but if you just look at those two Martel and El Paso sites, it's um, it's a ton, a ton of effort that the river is getting in those two sections there. Um, so continuing with total effort, um, I probably didn't need to include this slide in here. It's pretty similar to what you guys just looked at, but basically um, this is overall angler. This is just pure angler hours spent. Um, so it's right up here. This is the Brule River, um, Northern Wisconsin. Um, very popular, I'm sure a ton of you have fished it. Um, so it's right behind the Brule and the amount of angler hours that get spent on it every year. This is the Brule from 92 again? Um, yes, their 1992 survey. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's probably different. It might be a little bit different today. I know it's still super, super popular. Um, so moving on to catch rates. Um, we know there's a lot of anglers out there. Are how many fish are they catching and how does that compare to other streams across the continent? So total actual catch was 1,627 trout that were reported by anglers. Higher, a little bit higher catch rates at El Paso the Martell, and that really reflects the trout density that's at both of those places. Martell generally has about half the, the trout density that El Paso has. Um, when we surveyed it in that year, it was about 2,500 fish per mile. The El Paso area was about 45 to 5,000 fish per mile. So basically catch rates are reflecting the actual density of fish that are there. Um, total projected catch, since we didn't interview anglers every, every day of the week, we we're only there five. So if you project that out um, to days and hours that we weren't out there interviewing, it came out to um, 75, uh, about 7,500 brown trout um, throughout the season. That's how many people are catching. That's not how many they're keeping. Um, so keep that okay. in mind. So, somebody's got their mic unmuted. Um, so projected catch, um, obviously catch rates were highest in the month of May. That was when more people were out there. So basically, you can look at these people are catching on average about 1.7, 1.8 fish per hour um, historically in 1988. Um, and it's pretty similar, but it's dropped off a little bit from the 1988 survey. So right now it's an average of 1.3 or 1.4 per hour um, fish per hour for catch. So moving on to harvest, how many people actually keep? Um, very few. <laughs> This, um, we all, I mean, as a biologist, um, I kind of assumed that this was happening, hypothesized, um, you know, catch and release is um, extremely popular. Um, and that's what we saw in our harvest rates by English. So very low harvest, a total of 51 trout, brown trout were reported harvested um, during this entire survey. Um, that's about 0.04 trout per hour which is just next, pretty much next to nothing. You can see 0.3 fish per hour were did back in the 1988 survey and 0.04 fish per hour um, currently. So um, projected harvest for the entire season is 130 brown trout. Um, so when you have 5,000 fish per mile out there, that's kind of a drop in the bucket basically. Um, so there's basically no difference in harvest between non-resident and resident anglers. Um, um, a lot of people are very catch and release oriented. Um, and the reported lengths of fish harvested was kind of interesting. People reported harvesting fish below the minimum length limit, um, which whatever, but if you want to actually report that <laughs> is a different story. Um, but they reported harvesting fish from 10 to 17 inches. Um, mean length of fish harvested was about 13 inches. And you can see most of these fish were harvested in the months of May and May and June. So May had the most harvest, a little bit in October. Um, so that's about one fish harvested per 50 hours of fishing, if you want to look at it like that. 
Um, gear types, we also asked what people were using to fish. Um, we had the categories flies, spinners, minnows, worms, crankbaits um, that all people reported. So um, the most popular um, method of fishing was fly, um, followed by spinners and worms, crankbaits to a lesser extent. But if you want to look at um, the most efficient gear type, crankbaits were by far the most efficient gear type, catching about eight and a half fish per trip flies a little bit less efficient at almost six fish per trip. So I mentioned in the beginning, we did offer this optional management survey. I came up with these questions to try to gauge um, anglers and how they felt about different um, management um, that's going on in the area. So for this survey, we had about a 77% response rate. So 183 respondents answered these questions. The first question I asked was, are you satisfied with the management of trout streams in the area? And if not, what are your concerns? Um, most anglers were satisfied, luckily for me. 77% um, of those indicated they were very satisfied with the management of the streams in the area. Um, dissatisfaction, if people indicated that they were dissatisfied was mostly due to the early catch and release season. Um, so a few people didn't like that. Um, some people wanted more habitat projects. Some people wanted more brook trout in the Rush River. Um, the Kinney Dam removal and recovery was um, something that a couple people um, reported on the survey as being dissatisfied with. Some people were dissatisfied with the small size of trout um, and the amount of fishing pressure. Um, so basically, and then I also asked what streams you fish the most often other than the Rush and area. Um, these were the streams that people indicated they fished most often outside of the rush, which included um, the Kinney, the Trimbell, and the O'Galley, um, and then the Willow was there to a lesser extent as well. Oh, yep, <clears throat> double slide. So basically these are these are the next most popular streams. As you would think, you know, Lost is a little bit smaller stream, but it's a trip to the rush, so it's obviously gonna get fished pretty hard as well. Um, third question was, um, I wanted to gauge if people harvested fish and how they felt about people um, if they didn't harvest, how they felt about people that did. Um, um, so I asked, do you harvest fish? If so, how often? 60% did not harvest fish. Um, of those that did, 94% only occasionally harvested. And they also asked, how do you view others that harvest trout? Um, only 12% said nobody should harvest trout and 82% were fine with other people harvesting trout, which was um, good to see. I also asked, whether people would like to see quality or quantity opportunities, meaning that would you rather catch a quality or a choice size fish, um, or would you rather catch many fish regardless of size on you know any given fishing trip that you go on? Um, that would be split pretty evenly. Uh, about 49% indicated they'd, they'd rather have a trophy opportunity, um, and the other half would rather catch a lot of trout. Um, just interesting to see. Um, and I also asked, where would you rather the DNR conduct trout habitat improvement projects? And I was trying to gauge whether um, folks would like to see us work more on brook trout only streams or brook reserve streams, or if they don't care and they just want habitat projects on any stream regardless, as long as there's um, basically a resource concern. Um, vast majority of people wanted um, habitat projects on any trout stream, regardless of species. Um, and then I also asked, does anybody in here, I'll ask that, anybody know about the mode fishing access paths that we mow every year? We usually do it on Katy, Pine, and the Upper Trimbell, um, just to provide um, a little bit easier access for folks, um, you know, in the middle of the summer when the grass is tall and it's easier for people to get down if they have trouble getting down. So um, we do mow those every year right along the stream, we mow a path. And I just wanted to see how many were aware of that. Um, and if they use them. So 30% of people surveyed were aware that we um, mowed those. Um, and like I said, these are the locations. If anybody's interested in those, um, send me an email or give me a call at some point. So basically I can use the answers to all these questions to help manage the streams in the area and um, do outreach um, a little bit better. So that's, that was the goal of asking these questions. So basically overall what we found is is there's pretty similar demographics to the previous 1988 survey. 
Um, anglers will travel long distances to fish the rush. Um, they did 30 years ago and they're still traveling long distances now. Um, higher percentage of Minnesota anglers um, than the previous krill survey. Um, it's only 40 minutes you know, to St. Paul. Um, and even the Cactus chapter is mostly made up of Minnesota residents as well. Um, so several anglers stated that they traveled to fish the rush. Um, this was written down on several, not in these exact words, but several things um, or on several, several interviews, but they traveled to fish the rush because of the wild and scenic feel of the river and the ability to distance themselves from other anglers. Um, and there's also several class one and class two trout streams in pretty close proximity to the rush as well, that there's always options if the rush is pretty crowded or busy. So um, we did see a pretty big increase in angler effort on the rush by 80%, 65% from these previous two surveys. So a lot more effort out there or a lot more anglers are fishing the rush for longer periods of time. Um, and there's a higher focus on catch and release um, instead of getting their limits, um, which is likely um, um, why, why you saw that increase in the trip um, length. So like anglers, historic surveys, we're only fishing, you know, a couple or three hours fishing the rush, and now we're fishing over four hours to get basically um, people aren't as concerned with getting their limits. So once, you know, anglers back in the day, their limits are gone. Um, now it's more of the experience, you know, just spending time out there, spending time in the water. Um, so that mindset has changed a lot. Um, and the fishery is also very different. Um, historically, rainbows were stocked um, on opening day, before opening day, and people were out there, um, you know, ready for that. There was the hype of the opening day. People went out there to harvest the rainbows. Um, and now it's kind of changed from um, that stocked fishery back to um, a naturally reproducing brown trout fishery. Um, so very different fisheries is likely what's driving that as well. Um, pressure is a lot more spread out over the course of, fish, of the fishing season, likely because of those reasons, the change in the fishery. So with this high alert effort, where did this fall out? This was in the 75th percentile for stream statewide as far as angler effort. You guys saw those graphs. Martell, very popular. Increased trip length, people are spending more time, um, higher angler density. Um, and so the total effort is over three times higher in Wisconsin trout streams. Um, and it's only second to the Brule River, basically, in Wisconsin. Higher catch rates in El Paso than Martell. You know, I said that reflected the fishery, basically, that was there. Um, much higher catch rates compared to the pre previous survey. You know, that's also with the change in the fishery. Very low densities you know, 30 years ago um, with stocking to maintain a fishery and now it's all naturally producing very high density fishery. So that's likely what um, is driving the change or the increase in the catch rates. Um, and then the West Fork of the Kikaku, um, this is how it compares, pretty similar, uh, one fish per 1.3 hours or one fish per 40 minutes, a little bit higher catch rates on the West Fork, Kikaku, um, but still um, very good catch rates on the rush. Harvest, Extreme decline in harvest from that 1988 survey. A lot of people used to keep a lot more trout um, back 30, 40 years ago. Um, similar harvest to the West Fork of the Kikaku, and it'll be, it's all catch and release, um, mostly you know across the driftless area, basically. Um, contributing to really this, so this is what I'm going to get into in a little bit. Um, and this is the lack of harvest or the low harvest is contributing to the relatively poor size structure of brown trout. Um, I'm going to get into that in a little bit. So basically, um, we call it density dependence. So in any given water body or stream, you know, there's only so many resources to go around. So the more fish you have, they're all competing with each other for those same resources. So, so that's going to affect how fast they're growing and what kind of condition they're in. Um, so basically, when you have these really high density fisheries, they're not going to be growing as good um, and they're going to be a, in a little bit poorer condition um, and is some of the other streams that don't have that high density. So basically, it's a, it's a negative interaction. Um, so basically, what we found from this, um, from this creel survey, is that the current fishing regulations aren't really appropriate for the Rush River and some of the other Pierce County streams that we have these high densities of brown trout. Um, 
majority of fish are in that six to 10 inch range um, annually. Be this is because of high annual recruitment, natural recruitment and from, sorry, high now with that high natural reproduction, we're having really good survival, which is we call recruitment. So those fish are recruiting fishery, they're surviving. So with that high reproduction and recruitment into the fishery, high survival, um, those fish are all competing with each other. So these six to 10 inch fish, they're in the one to two year old range. Um, their growth rates are significantly impacted by each other basically because there's too many of them for the amount of resources that are present. Um, the six to 10 inch fish make up about 85% of the population in the Rush River on any given year. Um, so um, with a change in fishing regulations, it likely won't impact the size structure of the population unless people actually start keeping fish. Um, this would allow, um, a change in the regulations would allow increased harvest of these abundant small fish. Um, and this would promote the harvest of trout. Um, well, not this would promote, but, but we're trying to promote the harvest of trout um, through events or educational or outreach opportunities. So we definitely encourage people to keep trout, especially on these very high density streams. Um, it's only going to help the situation. It's going to thin them out a little bit. They'll be able to grow faster. Um, they'll be in better condition and we'll be able to get more, more fish in that quality trophy size category. So I'm going to transition to a little bit about our Rush River survey and it's going to tie into this creel survey what we found. Um, I did bring some sheets, but we have, I have whole reports on the creel survey and our Rush River um, trout survey from 2021. If anybody wants those, they're pretty lengthy. Um, and there's the trout, famous trout spreadsheet with all of the streams that we sample. There's about 80 sites on there that we sampled in 2022. Um, so if anybody wants those, pick one up. It has all, all the rivers that we survey from last year. So. But anyway, so if anybody wants a report for any of this, I have that, um, just feel free to shoot me an email. But basically, like I said, we have very high density trout streams, um, which is good. It's a good problem to have because you can work with it. It's not like we have these low density trout streams that are struggling to sustain themselves and we have to stock them. So this is a really good problem to have. Um, so we have these very high density trout streams, on average 3,000 to 5,000 fish per mile, Rush River, Cave Creek, Lost Creek, Plum Creek. Um, this is the 95th percentile for class one trout streams across the Driftless area, which is basically the best of the best trout streams in Wisconsin is in the Driftless area. So um, if you're comparing to apples to apples, it's at the top of its class, all of these streams for the abundance of brown trout. Um, that's what these graphs basically show. The 90th percentile is the red line. You can see um, this is the Rush River alone at Stonehammer throughout from 2000 to 2022, and it's always had always had very high densities annually. Um, this is the number per mile. This is the 90th percentile as well. This is for Plum Creek. Um, it's right around that 90th percentile usually, especially in recent years. Um, and then Zach's younger beer. I'm not going to get into that, but you can see. It's doing very well also. It's not to the extent the rush is, but it's um, doing very, very well. A lot of natural reproduction there as well. So like I said, natural reproduction is strong and consistent. Um, Cave Creek is the lowest one. So this graph shows all these different streams, all the different, different colored lines are different streams um, that I'm talking about. So the 90th percentile, once again, is that red line. Um, and this, this is young of your, <laughs> oh, there we go. Okay. Um, so this is young of year per mile. This is how we measure natural reproduction. So this is all the fish less than five and a half inches that we get in our sample. So we know those fish came from that spring's hatch, basically. Um, so this is young of year natural reproduction. Um, the rush is this solid black line and all of these other ones. So cave is lowest, but even cave is still in the 80th percentile pretty much every year. Um, for natural reproduction. Um, this is survival and recruitment. This is Stonehammer. This is down at Vino in the Valley. I know I'm showing you guys a lot of graphs, but just bear with me. <laughs> um, so this is um, a length frequency distribution. You can see the number of fish in this six. So this is a year class. These are age ones, these are age twos, age ones, age twos. Um, 
you can see how survival um, is from year to year. It's very high, very strong, what we call recruitment. So they're, they're surviving, contributing to the fishery, basically. Um, so there's a lot, a lot of fish in that, in this range. Very few fish over 12 inches, relatively speaking. Um, so we have these high densities of these small fish um, annually. This is every year, 85%, 87% are in the 60% inch range. Like I said, um, this is contributing to that density dependence. It's contributing to the poor size structure. Um, so we have a lot of small fish and they're all competing with each other for the same resources. A few of those fish will make it out like you saw that picture, the 25 incher. You know, there's good numbers of um, fish over 12 inches still. But if we can thin out these smaller ones, we're going to have even more fish over 12 inches, even better size structure. So some fish make it through that bottleneck and they're able to feed on whatever they want. Um, that's why they get to those really large sizes because they're not competing with a lot of other fish in that size range. Um, so that's basically what we've got going on in the rush. Um, there's a lot going on in this graph. This is not mine. This is from the biologist down in La Crosse, um, Kirk Olson. Um, he basically pit tagged brown trout in all of these streams. Um, so the pit tag is basically like when you microchip your dog or your cat. Um, so the pit tag is unique to that fish. So when you recapture it, you know that that individual fish is the same one that you caught, you know, whatever date, you know how long it was. So um, he measured growth rates um, and was able to determine the maximum size that a fish would get in, I don't know, <laughs> the maximum size that, I don't know what's happening. <laughs> Maybe the cable. You see, I suspect that whatever it is, it's a problem with the cable in the meeting room because we can still see it on Zoom. Okay. Yeah, that's correct. It's a little fuzzy, but I'll just keep going. Um, so basically, this line is um, a one-to-one -one ratio. So wherever these lines, we can think of them as different streams, wherever they intersect this one-to-one -one ratio, that's basically the maximum size of brown trout um, that a brown trout will get in that particular stream based off of his tagging data. Um, so you can see these streams up here at all. So they have a very high potential to reach large maximum sizes. And that these are the streams that have very low densities of brown trout. You see these streams down here, they're intersecting this line at about 11 to 12 inches. So that's, mm, that's basically the size but these, the maximum size that these fish are gonna get in these streams based on the density of fish present. Um, so like I said, current regulations in the rush, 12 inch, um, um, oh no. <laughs> okay. That's some mighty tricks I learned. Nice. That and the rebooting, that's there. <laughs> yes. Okay, I'll see if I can make it through this. Um, so basically the current regulation of the 12 inch minimum length limit isn't really appropriate for the rush and some of these other high density streams anymore. Um, this length limit was put in when, when that regulation or when the fishery changed from the class two to the class one to try to protect those larger fish um, within the fishery and limit the harvest. So basically um, it's protecting the majority of fish from harvest causing the stacking up of fish right under the length limit. Um, so we're increasing that effective density dependence basically. Um, so this is, we're in the very early process or the very beginning of the process of potentially changing the regulation. So what I'm proposing um, is it the 12 inch maximum length limit. So this is what the Kinnickinnick River currently has. Um, 12 inch maximum limit, you can keep five per day under 12. Um, I'm also going to propose that folks can keep a one over, so one over 12 inches, um, if they so choose. So it would be the 12 inch maximum with one over 12 by fish bag limit per day. So it's basically the opposite of what the regulation currently is. So we're still gonna be, oh, thank you. <laughs> we're still, thank you, thank you. I really, um, I appreciate everybody's input and I wanna get all of, all of the input that I can for this. So if you guys, if you guys like it, if you guys don't like it, let me know. Um, that's what I'm here for, basically. So, 
switching this around. This will allow the harvest of these abundant small trout. And you can still keep your one over if you get a trophy or whatever. You want to keep a 13 or 14 inch fish to eat, fine. Hopefully that's what we can do. Um, this is going to improve growth rates if enough people harvest fish. Um, we, need the, we need the harvest increase. You know, by keeping fish, you're not going to hurt the fishery. That's why we have these regulations to prevent harm to the fishery, basically. Um, and this will also protect large fish and improve the size structure if harvest is high enough. Um, we have an, a couple other options in our toolbox that we could change the regulations to um, that I decided not to. Um, there's a 10 fish bag limit with no minimum. Um, they do, Kirk Olson down in La Crosse has that regulation on a few streams down there. Um, it does appear to have some impact, but he's seeing a slight decline in the fish over 12 inches. So I didn't want that to happen here. So that's why I'm kind of opting for this regulation. Um, and this is what I'm proposing so far. So with this, I will have public meetings in this year at some point um, over in Wisconsin. The dates are to come um, to try to get additional input and get everybody's um, comments and opinions heard with this. This is just part of our rule change process. Um, and if this did pass, it wouldn't be until 2026. <laughs> That's how long our process takes, unfortunately. Um, so it wouldn't go into effect until 2026, but the rule would go through spring hearings in 2025, basically. So this is kind of at the early stages of the process. And um, uh, this, so this is where I'm at, is proposing this to all of you um, and seeing what you guys think about it. So, and with that, I can take any questions um, or comments so that anybody we'll has. We'll start with a question on the- All on the chat, okay. If, uh, when... I'll let you do it. Okay. <laughs> I think I'm gonna they... repeat a question so you guys can hear. I think I'm gonna break. So Bob, do we have some, Questions? Yeah, we, we do have a couple of questions and I'm sure more will come in. I want to encourage everybody on the Zoom to ask questions. I see them coming in. But the first question comes from John Harrington, and he's wondering if there's any uh, consumption advisories that would affect uh, harvesting of trout on the rush. So is there, the question is, is there some consumption recommendation that would affect uh, the harvest on the rush? Yeah, it's like consumption advisories because of chemicals and so forth in the fish. Uh, consumption advisory, chemicals, so how much should we consume in the right. rice? Right. Um, so good question. No, there's currently not any consumption advisories for any of the trout streams that I work on. Um, we do test for that periodically in different fish populations. Um, right now, there's no consumption advisories. Trout, they grow super fast and they die pretty young, so there's not a lot out of opportunity for them to accumulate, um, you know, kind of be metals or anything like that. So, um, no, there's not any consumption advisories. Okay, so the, the next question is from uh, Mary Lilly. Casey, you're going to love this question. Why does it take three years? <laughs> yeah, so, I want to know that too. So, question is, oh. why does it take three years to change their regulation? Yeah, so Wisconsin's process. From what I understand, I work with Minnesota biologists because I also cover the St. Croix River. Um, their process is a little bit more, a little faster and a little bit more streamlined than Wisconsin. So every other year we have um, advisory questions where we can, we can put questions on our spring hearings in April and people can vote on them as advisory questions. That doesn't mean that it'll change the rule. That's just to gauge public input or public support. Then the following year, we could put those, what we had as advisory questions, as rule change questions. So like this year, 2023 is a rule change year. So I have several questions right now that'll be on the spring hearings in April where people can vote. And if they if they approve or support those enough, I can put those through as rule changes. So then they would change. They won't go into effect until the following fishing opener. So if they pass now, they'll go into effect in 2024. So that's kind of the process um, as to why that's our process. That's a question for somebody much higher level than me, but um, that's kind of what we have to go through right now. And that, and it also allows plenty of time to get public input and do outreach and let folks know what and why you're, why you're proposing something. So good question. <laughs> 
So I guess the the complete answer is if you don't like it, you have to become a Wisconsin resident and you have to vote. Uh, but, but 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 moving on, we have we have a question from Jim Burrett. He says, "I would like to see bait as well as barb and treble hooks not allowed during the catch and release season. Is that possible?" Can you repeat the question? So so he's saying, is it possible to outlaw bait as well as barbed and trebled hooks during the catch and release season? Okay, so the question is, during the catch and release season, can they ban like the treble hook and, and things like that? So. And bait, yeah. Yeah, so and right barbed, now it is artificial hooks. And barbed hooks. Yeah. Um, right now it's artificial only um, during the catch and release season. Um, but the treble hooks and the bear or the treble hooks aren't hooked bar allowed. Um, yeah, I mean, it would be possible to make that a rule change. Um, that would have to go through the same process that any other change has to go through. So, um, people, so with our process, um, any member of the public can propose a rule change. Um, it's called a citizen resolution. Um, so if people are interested in proposing something like that, they can always do that. And that can go on the spring hearings and get voted for as well. So there's always that option if you're a Wisconsin resident. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, if someone were to propose that, you know, it would it would have to go through the, through the same process. What does the science say about that? So there's not, right now, basically, what the literature says, um, there's not a lot of mortality, population level impacting mortality associated with barbed hooks. Um, bait is another story, um, but right now, you know, there's not, a, there might be some mortality, but it's not gonna impact the population at that, at that level, basically. Can you communicate with us with the field so we can follow you? Yeah, I I actually Casey, I, I'm, Casey, I'm sorry. If you get a follow-up <laughs> question from your audience, could you please repeat it for the Zoom people? Oh yeah. <laughs> he just asked um if we can communicate with the folks so that they can come out and follow us along with our stream surveys. Um and I, I occasionally do that. I mean we you know it'd be nice to have a hundred people follow along, but <laughs> that's really impossible. But I do have people here and there. Um, I can, you know, if somebody is interested, I have did that where they can text me and I'll be like, hey, we're going to be here at this bridge at 8 a.m. either, and they can follow along and watch us and do whatever. So, yeah, there is that opportunity, but it'll have to be limited. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, Casey, two things. First of all, I did turn off the, the sharing for now. We can reshare if we need to, to, to go back and look on something in your presentation, but I thought people might... Uh, be more interested in seeing the room and you than than seeing one page on a PowerPoint. Uh, okay. But it, yeah. But anyway, the the next question is from Mike Grangs, and he thinks he, he's asking, "Do you think that enough people will keep fish that the bag limit changes will be effective?" So the question is, uh, once the regulation change, if she thinks enough people will keep fish, that's going to be an that will be an impact on the river. Yeah. Size of fish. Um, good question. It's hard to say. So with all of this and with the data that we're that we've got that I showed you guys, you know, from across and from this area and the Creel survey, we're trying to promote that a little bit. So um we've been we're writing articles to try to let people know that it's not bad if you want to keep some fish, you know, you're actually gonna be helping the fishery in, you know, in certain streams. It's not, it doesn't apply to all streams. Um, so we're trying to do some outreach and promoting um, harvesting fish. So, but no, I mean, I'm, unless things really, really change, um, you know, with people, you know, with the catch and release um, in these high density streams, um, the regulation change probably won't have much of an impact. In the Kinney, we haven't seen much of an impact, and that regulation has been in place for seven years now. Um, so, yeah, unless something really changes and people's mindsets change and they want to start eating more trout, um, we probably won't see much. But at least if we change it, you know, and somebody wants to go out there and harvest, you know, five, eight inch or 10 inch trout that they keep, they do have the opportunity. 
Um, so there's, you know, there's always, you know, you can pick away at it, and make improvements as you go. So there's a follow up question in the room. Mm -hmm. If you wanted to take a section of the river and manage it, fish, would you? What would that be? How much of that is habitat? How much of that is regulation? You know, what would it? What would that? What would it actually be? It seems like rivers productive. Yes. But it's not. It's too crowded to launch an engineer. Yeah. Yeah. Good question. Um. Yeah. Lawson, do you remember what it, the question was? Yeah. So, folks on the Zoom. yeah, for folks on Zoom, the question was basically it had to do with the, the quantity versus quality question. Um, would folks rather see, well, would folks rather catch a lot of trout or have this quality or trophy opportunity? And it was pretty evenly split. Um, and is it possible to manage different sections of a river for different opportunities, basically? Um, and how much of that is impacted by habitat and um, fishing regulations and fishing pressure, et cetera. Um, so yes, it is possible um, to manage that on the same river. And we kind of have that on the rush. Um, so what I presented on um, for the Creel survey focused on the rush from Highway 63 to Highway 10. If, and it has a lot to do with habitat, that, that's a key. So as you get lower in the rush below Highway 10, Water tends to warm up a little bit. Habitat's a little more degraded. It's not as dry gradient. It's sandy and slower and wider and shallower um, as you go down to Highway 10. So because of that, the natural reproduction drops way off. And so you don't have those high density fish. You have, if I go back to it, we had about 300 fish per mile in one of our stations way down by Maiden Rock. Um, but when you go down there, the percentage of fish over 12 inches was that I mean that section had the highest percentage of fish over 12 inches so um and that's due to the habitat and the warm the warmer water um so basically um the colder the water the less diversity fish diversity that you have so the less forage that's available you know they're going to be eating more flies um and macro invertebrates so bugs um and then if you move more into warm water you're getting into a more diverse fishery um, and you're gonna have more forage available because more um, more species of fish can handle that warmer water. So you're gonna have a lot more forage, but a lot less density of trout. And with all of that forage, they're gonna be able to grow faster. And that's why you get those bigger fish, usually in the lower um, the lower reaches of any river really. Um, so it's, it's really a function of habitat, but you can manage, um, you know, different sections of a stream with different regulations, you know, if people, if there is enough harvest, you know, it is possible, um, but you also got to look at the habitat too. There's always that major interaction. Does that kind of answer your question or kind of sort of? So why not make the spread the habitat and Gotcha. So improve the habitat on a given stretch to have a trophy, a potentially trophy fish tree. Um, yeah, you could do that if you have the water quality, if you have the temperature, if you have the forage, you know, those things are hard to influence um, by, you know, our habitat practices, basically. But we do do that with habitat. Um, with some of our streams, we've been finding that our habitat practices, um, depending on how we do it, basically um, caters to large adult brown trout. Um, so we're really good at making adult brown trout habitat. We're not so good at making young of year habitat or brook trout habitat. So we, we can influence that a lot for sure. Um, and we do, we're doing that now. So we do have a bunch of stretches that you can go to that are probably going to yield to you a trophy size brown trout if you go there for, for our habitat work that we're doing. Yeah, so we, we got another question in the room. Yeah, it's not, it's good. It's Questions in the room and then it will go back online. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, good question. So um, the question was, well, on Duncan Creek um, over, you know, kind of in the Eau Claire area, there was an effort by the fisheries biologists to move some brown trout from a high density area out to a low density area to see if they could improve growth rates and the size structure. Um, they also did that with brown trout on the elk, um, on Elk Creek, um, also in the Eau Claire area. And the question was, did it work? Um, and the answer is yes, it did, um, but it was, um, it, it kind of only worked for a year or two. Like basically you had to keep removing fish and moving them out of the area. Um, and if that stopped, it basically kind of went back to what it was before you started the, the moving of the fish. So yeah, we got some more questions around in the front here. I'll get to you in the back. Problem is you have yeah so the question was we have um some we have a ton of, or high density of trout in the river and will that change on its own in the future at some point right is that what captured okay um so yeah, I mean, it, it'll be, it'll be interesting. So like I said, the river changed, you know, 30, 40 years ago, it used to be more of a warmer water fishery, the habitat was degraded with changing land use practices. Um, and the connection to groundwater, the river really cooled off. And that's why we have this amazing fishery that we don't have to stock anymore. So could that happen in the future? Yes. Um, I'll be honest, because we've got climate change, we've got, you know, more droughts, we've got increased frequency and intensity of floods. So we've got these things coming down the pipe. It could potentially change. Um, for the rush, you know, it's, it's gonna be gradual. Um, we're likely gonna lose the rush, at least the main stem of it as potentially trout water by mid-century. It's what um, has been predicted um, by climate models. Um, so the main stem of the rush might be a smallmouth bass fishery by 2050. Um, so it could change. Right now we're kind of, you know, in the heyday. The river is maybe the best it's ever going to be. Um, so in the future, you know, if that does change, we monitor, we monitor the crab other, <laughs> if I'm being honest, um, which is awesome. Um, so we have a very, we have a very good um, finger on the pulse, if you will, of the fishery. So we, we can react to things very quickly. Um, if something did come down the pipe, you know, something crashed, there was a manure spill, there was a huge fish kill. We do have the ability to implement emergency rules or emergency regulations to protect the fishery. So we could do that. Um, but, you know, if we see it declining, we, you know, I, like I showed these trends, we've been monitoring it annually from the year 2000 to now. Um, so if we see something dropping off, you know, in a couple of years, we can react to that and, you know, change it to protect it or whatever, or stock it or, you know, alter our habitat practices to do that too. So that kind of answer your question a little bit. Yeah. 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 Yeah, the question was, what are the natural predators of brown trout and are there any that would maybe dine specifically on those smaller six to 10, six to 12 inch fish? Um, so yeah, there's a ton of natural predators, um, otters, birds of prey, blue herons, um, and the brown trout themselves, they're, they're major cannibals. Um, so they're eating basically whatever's gonna fit in their mouth. Um, but those are the main, you know, if there is a, you know, smallmouth bass, there are a few smallmouth bass in the lower Rush River, you know, those are going to prey on whatever brown trout they can find. Um, but basically, even with all of those predators, we still have these really, you know, high density, 5,000 fish per mile every year um, kind of situation. Maybe take a few more yeah, you got any more questions on Zoom? Yes, we do. Uh, so a question from David Rank, how does the fish density on the rush compare to the Trimbell and the Kinney? 
Yeah, so how does the, the fish density on the rush compare to the trim bell and the kinney? So the kinney is very similar, um, still high densities of brown trout in the kinney, pretty similar 3,000 to 5,000 per mile range. Um, the trim bell, the rush is much higher. Um, the trim bell is a class two. Um, we do stock it still with the brown trout to maintain and sustain the fishery. Um, so um, trout density and trim bell are about half of what the rush is. It's on average about 2,000 to 3,000. Um, the highest site that we survey on the trim bell is about 3,500 fish per mile, um, kind of in the middle section of river. Um, above Highway 10. Uh, it actually, in one of our habitat projects is where we see our highest densities on the trim bell. Okay, uh, another question from uh, Doug Moran. Uh, excellent work and presentation. What is the average lifespan of wild-born brown trout? Yes, so what's the average lifespan of a wild brown trout? Um, it varies a little bit um, from stream to stream or region to region. Um, on average around here, it's probably in the four to five to six year old range. Um, they don't live very long at all. They're longer lived than brook trout. Brook trout are doing good if they get to three. Um, brown trout are doing good if they get to five or six. Um, some of those bigger fish like that fish that I showed you, um, you know, that fish is obviously older than that. So there are, there's always exceptions to the rule, but that's on average what they, they get to. What did yeah. they die? Um, just natural mortality once they get so big and they've been through so many years of spawning and um, migrating and all the movement, um, you know, something, you know, once you, once they get older, you know, they're just slowing down, their metabolism slows down um, and they're more easy prey for, for their predators basically. So natural mortality, um, other fish species like sturgeon, um, they're kind of at the opposite end of the spectrum. They grow really, really slow and they live a really, really long time. And they get to the point where basically, you know, after they're a hundred years old, they can live to, um, you know, they're, they're just like us that, you know, everything kind of slows down and they become more vulnerable basically. So yeah, any other questions on? Yes, Zoom? here's a question from Jean. Uh, he says, do you have any data on the quote unquote health of the rush? I saw few hatches on the river this past year and no crayfish. Yeah, so we only monitor, so okay, the question was, uh, yeah, let's read that. The question was, do you have any data on the overall health of the rush? Um, he saw very few hatches and very few crayfish. So unfortunately, we only monitor the fish. Um, we do have water quality staff that um, does basically the water quality side of thing. They do a they do a little bit on macroinvertebrates um, or insects, um, so they do have some data on that. There is a working group um, that Carl Nelson is a part of, and he's starting um, basically surveys on the Rush River. Um, with this group of people. Um, I haven't attended a meeting yet, but he's starting that. So he's he's going to be looking at all of that, the macroinvertebrates macro um, and some non-game fish species from what I understand. Um, so he will be looking at that. So that's to come from him. Questions about that, I can probably get you in touch with our water quality people and see if they have any data about that. Yeah, Claire, uh, Casey, just to clarify that, Carl Nelson is a member of Kayaptowish, uh, the chapter yes. in Wisconsin. And I know that he's working with a DNR uh, biologist named Mike Miller. And I know that they, they've recruited some folks from TCTU as well, but they plan to be doing a lot of surveys of, um, of macroinvertebrates. Uh, so I'm yes. hoping that we can have some, some information on that in the future. Awesome. So basically, there's some surveys that they will do on the bugs in the river coming up. Sure. But there's some results. Yes. Cool. Uh, the next Anybody? question. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. I'll I'm sorry. Next, next question is from Paul Connors, and he he's wondering if you recommend that those of us who fish the rush regularly that we uh, keep trout now, even with the present regulations. I don't think he's suggesting keeping trout under 12 inches, but should we be keeping <laughs> trout over 12 inches? 
Right. Yeah. <laughs> so the question was, do you recommend um, people keeping fish on the rush with the current regulation? So fish over 12 inches. Um, very good question. Yes, I do recommend that you keep fish um, over 12 inches. I wouldn't go hog wild. <laughs> I would like every time you go there, don't, you know, maybe not keep your three 15 inches or whatever, maybe, but um, yes, some harvest is encouraged, um, you know, that's only going to help, but with this, you know, kind of, we're in limbo, I guess you would say, um, with the hopefully changing of the regulations in a couple years that will benefit the fishery, um, you know, maybe, you know, like I said, don't, don't go there with the intent to harvest three of your 12 inches every day, um, just to, you know, limit that, but once we get it changed, um, yes, yes, go for it, but yeah, like I said, there's there's plenty of fish in there and if you want to keep if you want to keep your trout now for sure do it okay great um we got one question in the audience oh sorry okay. go ahead or maybe a couple um did you want to yeah i didn't have a question but yeah. i just wanted to mention that tc uh, is way down to be involved in that uh, early study with carl we have some volunteers that are Awesome. I believe it's starting. Yes. Very good point. Yeah. Yeah, the question was um is there any data um present about the impacts of neonicotinoids on trout populations and bug populations and subsequent trout populations um yes i personally i don't have um any data myself but the biologist down La Crosse, um kirk olson he did a study um with a couple of other dnr staff on at least one, maybe two streams down in that area with the impacts of that because they were seeing um, pretty a pretty extreme drop in hatches. Um, so he does have data about that. And if you have questions about that, you can email me and I can get you in touch with him um, because that is available. A few more questions in the room and then we'll back to this room. Okay. More questions in the room? Yeah. So if the uh, rush hasn't been stocked since what, 2006, why hasn't the, the river itself equalized the population? Why is there still such a high end for mortality or catch? Yeah, so the question was with no stocking, why hasn't the river um, kind of equalized itself or balanced itself with the trout density that's there? Um, that that's the question. Um, yeah, so right now, you know, this 3,000 to 5,000 per mile, I would say about three, three or 4,000 per mile is basically what, it's basically carrying capacity. So that's the amount of fish that the river can withstand um, or produce basically. So we have very high natural reproduction. Those fish are surviving very, very well, um, probably, they're surviving better than a lot of trout populations. So because of that, that's why we have these high densities um, and it's trying to equalize itself. Generally when densities get too high, you see increased mortality. Um, and we're not seeing that here, but we are seeing impacts you know, to the growth rates and to the size structure um, and to the condition of fish. Um, so you can look, we can look at um, the lengths and the weights of fish and we can make basically an equation to where it gives you a score, like a body score of the fish. Um, the fish in the rush, you know, and the kinney are in much poorer condition um, than some fish in some lower density streams. So it's trying, it's trying to do that on its own. Um, and it's right now it's impacting the condition of the fish and how fast they're able to grow. Um, but it's, it's basically, it's trying, but it'll probably never, never equalize out with it's really hard to have a high abundance of big fish. Um, it's hard to get that balance. Um, it kind of like teeter totters and sometimes you get it, but it, it's very fleeting. Um, it might happen one year and then they're gone and 
because there's too high mortality on that. So it's always, it's changing and there's always like that dynamic. Um, so it's hard to get that balance and keep it basically, but that's kind of what we're seeing right now. It's, it's there. we lost on site hey can you uh can you hear us can hear you but can't see you okay okay but uh something happened with my computer it's rebooting so i'm on another screen right now so we'll be able to keep the questions this way so uh i always keep cancel when i see that i'm, I'm always afraid what's going to happen <laughs> to my computer so i know now <laughs> Yeah, yeah, we can hear you. We can hear you find Eve on your backup. So please keep the questions going. And I still have more questions from the Zoom audience too. If you don't have any questions in the in the room. Okay. Yeah, we've got one. Um, the question was, what kind of impact does the flooding have, and does it impact a uh, different size class of fish more than the other? Um, so yes, usually what we see, um, like that flood that we had in 2020. Um, it depends on what time of the year that it happens, but usually that impacts the small fish a lot more just because they don't have, you know, the swimming ability and um, to get out of the way of, you know, the high velocities that the larger fish do. Um, so usually we see a pretty high impact on those little guys that were hatched that year. That year, however, 2020 and 2021, we had crazy natural reproduction in all of the streams that I manage and pretty much across the driftless. Um, so because of those super high year classes, we had young of year all over the place. So even with that flood, we didn't see an impact to that year class just because it was so big. Um, but yes, usually it, it impacts the smaller fish that were hatched that year the most. Um, that's usually what happens. Yeah. Any more questions? Yeah, you had a question? This is more of a summary and confirmation. It might sound more negative. <laughs> it seems like we're, if the goal is to reduce the density of the smaller size fish, and if, if the regulations are out in 2026, probably one of the results of regulations until 2029, more sure surveys have to have done. Right. And it doesn't seem like we're confident that more people are going to start keeping fish. So the question in my mind is that and what? Like, what can right. what's in the toolbox if people want to start taking smaller fish? Yeah, so the question was, well, kind of a comment to um, if, let me see, make sure I get it, <laughs> if we change the regulations and that doesn't happen until 2026 and then we don't see any potential impacts of the regulation until a couple years after that, 27 or 28, um, are there other options in the toolbox to improve the size chart or improve the fishery um, if people don't start don't start keeping fish. Um, yes and no. I mean like I said it's a good it's a good problem to have. It's a better problem to have than very low density of fish and you're struggling to keep it around and you're stocking and you're trying to do habitat and nothing's working. Um, so it's a better problem than that but with with this fishery, you know, with the habitat that's there and their production, um, that's likely not going to change unless we see drastic increases in water temperature or something crazy like that. Um, so, yeah, I mean, to reduce, so in a, to be extreme, um, I'm doing brown trout removal in another stream where we are physically removing the brown trout by shocking them um, in an effort to maintain a brook trout fishery that was at on the verge of collapse um so there's that i mean i don't we, 
we can kill the whole river if we wanted to, which we never, we never would, but we do have, you know, chemicals throughout known that we use to kill whole lakes sometimes and streams. Um, that, that would never be an option with the rush. Um, I'm just saying that, you know, we do that sometimes with other, other things, but we would never do that with the rush. So um, just because of the fishery that it is, um, you know, it's renowned. Um, so other options other than, you know, reducing densities by harvest, you know, that's generally what I have in toolboxes, habitat, stocking, and changing regulations. That's basically what I have in my toolbox to, to impact how people use the resource. So long one, the answer to your question is there's not, other than physically removing trout, not much that we can do unless something changes with the habitat. Do you ever change regulation around the yeah. <laughs> yeah, the question was, um, can you change the regulations to increase harvest or something that would impact the trout during the spawning season? Um, you know, that's interesting. I don't, yeah, I don't know. I mean, you, you could in theory. Um, um, very fine. Very fine. On mute. So now oh, there we go. We're back again. Maybe he okay. got his computer rebooted. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, what? there you go. Now you're uh, right. computer. See, I, I'm, I'm looking at the, uh, I'm looking at the, yeah, Eve, I'm I'm looking at the clock and it seems like we got five minutes left. I don't know if Casey is able to stay later. If she is, maybe we can finish up the Zoom questions and then people who want to stick around and, and chat a little bit more can do that. Does that work um, for you, Casey? I can stay for a little bit um, and answer a few more questions, but then I'll probably have to go. Um, just yeah, because you live in Dunn County. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, but I will. That's a very interesting question with this guy had, so I'll, I'll answer that. So potentially you could. I mean, fish are pretty easy to target during the spawn. Um, that could increase harvest of those fish. Um, that would be an option. I When I used to work out west, um, we had an inland population of uh, Chinook salmon, and we would go um, when they were spawning, and we would destroy their reds. Um, to limit their population because it was a very uh, limited population itself. It, it had a lake and they would spawn in this single river. So we we could really impact them. We knew exactly how many reds and we would be like, nope, our quota is a hundred reds and that's all that we would allow. So um, not that that would ever happen on the rush. I mean, it, it would be impossible to do first of all, but increasing harvest during the spawn is interesting. Um, it might have an impact. Yeah. 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 Do you have just a follow up to that? Yeah. Can you effectively capture and transport fish from a high density or low density streams? Is that, a, is that an option to actually plot so that density and go to that to go to the lower rivers? Yeah. Great question. So the biologists in Eau Claire did a little bit of that with. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, I'm horrible at that. So the question was, um, can you move trout from an area of high density or a river of high density to an area of low density um, to help out both streams or both areas? Um, the biologists in Eau Claire did that um, on Elk Creek um, and then on Zunkin as well. And there was um, short term benefits to that, um, but it it basically requires that every year. And right now with our um, movement restrictions for fish because of disease, uh, specifically VHS, um, we can't move fish from water body to water body that aren't connected um, because of that concern. We can if we get a certain percentage of those health tested and then you have to hold them for so long and then you can move them. And so it's kind of a pain, but if that ever changed, um, you know, that might be an option in the rush as well, because we, we could do that. Right. Right. Yeah, unfortunately. Um, yeah, we could do it. There's just a lot of hurdles to jump through. But so we'll take two more questions on Zoom. So two more. Uh, she can, Casey needs to hit the road. So. Two more questions on Zoom, he said. Okay. 
Uh, yeah, and I um, I did tell folks that if uh, we don't get to their questions, we can um, send you an email and get the other ones answered. But um, yeah. the next question was from Jake Foss. He was wondering, for the anglers that didn't keep fish, did your survey provide any insights on why? Yeah, no, um, we did, did our survey include a question um, on why, if folks didn't keep fish, why did they not? Um, we didn't specifically ask that, um, so it, it, it's kind of up in the air, but in our optional survey, we did ask people if they harvested, um, and then how did they view others that harvested, and the vast majority of people did view harvest as, like, they were fine with it, they supported it, um, that other people did that, but the vast majority did not, but we didn't ask why. Okay, thank you. Uh, so last question uh, from Mike, how would a change in regulations on the rush affect brook trout? Yeah, so how would a change in regulations on the rush affect brook trout? Um, so on the rush, you know, like I said, we, there are brook trout throughout, they're in pretty low density. Um, they're mostly in the tributaries and the, in the really small tributaries like um, Morgan Cooley and Crystal Springs Cooley. Um, there's still some brookies in loss. They're kind of declining, um, same way in Cave Creek. Um, so we mostly see brookies in the tributaries. They do frequent the rush, um, but I mean, they would be they would be up for harvest as well. Um, but in our creel survey, there was a total of, I wanna say it was less than 10 brook trout were reported caught and two of those were harvested. Um, so. Yes, there would be brook trout harvested, but um, likely not to the point where it would influence those populations because those the, the brookies are highly connected to those little tributary streams as well. So, good question. In other streams, it would, it would be a different story. Um, in Dunn County, for example, that I that's mostly brook trout water and um, those streams that has a five fish bag limit, no minimum. Um, and brookies are doing pretty good over there. And there is more harvest over there um, compared to Pierce County. So, okay, um, well, we, uh, we know you got to hit the road. So this is it from the Zoom audience. We may send you a few more questions by email. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, anybody feel free to reach out to me via email or phone. I've got tons of reports for the rush and any other stream you guys are interested in. So feel free to get a hold of me. Well, I was very impressed. There was lots of questions, and you answered yes. all the questions. Yeah, was very I impressed. tried. I <laughs> Thank you all for coming tonight. And you're going to do some questions. You have some follow up questions. I believe you have your emails. If not, you have Bob's email, my email. Send us a question, and we'll point them in through. And, uh, and then copy. Copy her so she can get the response back to you. So thank you so much for coming tonight. And we're going to meet again next month, March, at this location as well. So like I explained uh, last meeting, uh, the intention was to alternate between the St. Paul location and over here, St. Paul, the Maplewood location told us they're, they're renovating over there. So it should be better, beautiful next year. And uh, so for the rest of the, for well, March, April, May, we'll meet over here, and then 